Good day, viewers. Uh, my name is Dennis Burke. I am the vice president of the Reinsurance Association of America. I will be your moderator today for what I hope and expect will be a robust and candid discussion on climate, the energy transition, and the role of insurance. I'm joined today by a panel of experts who I, I will very briefly introduce. Uh, greater details are in their bios on the Connecticut website. In alphabetical order and by, by title, we'll introduce the insurance commissioners first. Minnesota Insurance Commissioner Grace Arnold, who uh, is in charge of the Department of in Commerce, which includes insurance. North Dakota Insurance Commissioner John Gottfried, who is also the current NAIC Vice President. Uh, Washington Commissioner Mike Kreidler, who has been very active in uh, climate and climate disclosure issues uh, during his long tenure with the NAIC. Uh, Samantha Danowski, who is the state director for the Connecticut chapter of the Sierra Club. And John Huff, who is the president of the Association of Bermuda Insurers and Reinsurers and the former NAIC member and president. So <clears throat> in light of the, the time constraints for such a uh, broad topic, why don't we try to frame the issue and then jump into some more details. So uh, Samantha, why don't you give us, you know, the Sierra Club view about climate change and energy transition and uh, as just a, a brief framing statement. Yeah, I would love to. Thank you so much, Dennis, and to the Connecticut Department of Insurance for the opportunity to join this conversation. Um, as Dennis said, I'm Sam Donowski, the state director of Sierra Club's Connecticut chapter. Um, Sierra Club is the nation's oldest and largest environmental organization. We work to advance climate solutions and ensure that everyone has access to clean air, clean water, and a healthy environment. And um, as I'm sure everyone knows, we're just seeing increasingly the devastating impacts of climate change. In 2023, wide swaths of our nation experienced heat like never seen before, um, dangerous heat waves here in the Northeast. We saw um, damaging flooding and continue to see it. We experienced poor air quality from wildfires. Ocean temperatures are off the charts. Um, the list goes on. What We've known for decades is what is causing climate change, and that is human caused by burning fossil fuels. We also have known for a very long time what the solutions are, and that is to stop burning fossil fuels and transition to clean and renewable technologies. And right now, those technologies are readily available um, to be deployed and help solve this crisis. But there's obstacles in the way. Um, there's inaction. There's the fossil fuel interests that want to keep profiting off of their product. Um, but we got to get over these obstacles. We have until 2030. That's uh, approximately 2,250 days um, to vastly reduce greenhouse gases to avoid the worst of this crisis. And where insurers come to play here is that insurers first are faced with, um, have, they're on the hook for the damages from climate change, um, but they're also um, some of the biggest supporters of the fossil fuel industry. They invest their dollars into fossil fuel interests, hundreds of billions by last accounting, and they also um, underwrite fossil fuel companies and projects. Um, and a big problem we see right now is insurers are backing out of areas that have experienced climate disaster, but they're not backing out of fossil fuels um, as readily. They really need to play their that, part. Okay. Oops. And <laughs> we want to make sure we're, that they... We're, we're, we're going to get back to all of the, an opportunity to talk about all those things. Uh, but I want to give some of our other panelists an opportunity to present their framing uh, statements before we jump right into things. So, um, Commissioner Arnold, uh, can you share with us your views about the current and likely future energy mix? 
Sure. So um, thanks to Commissioner Mays and the department for putting together this panel. I'm really grateful to be here. So one of the things that's unique about the Department of Commerce in Minnesota is uh, among insurance regulators is that we have oversight over portions of our energy system. So one of the things that we're seeing a lot of and we anticipate to see more of is a transition from uh, from fossil-based um, energy generation to renewable gen energy uh, generation. And that looks like a couple of different things. So, you know, wind and solar are much more prevalent now than you've seen before. And, and, that, and then there are other um, technologies like hydrogen, there's um, advanced nuclear is something that gets discussion. There's some of these other technologies that you know, are showing some promise as, um, you know, potential in particular ways to have um, generation when the wind isn't blowing or the, the sun isn't shining. Uh, so so that's one way that the, the energy sector is changing. The other way is that it's much more spread out than it was, you know, than it has been over time. So, you know, 30 years ago, you had five or six, um, coal or natural gas or nuclear plants in a state or in an area. And those would be, you know, generating most of the uh, electricity or for that area. Now you see wind assets all across, um, you know, particularly plains areas. You see big solar arrays and though there are more of those and they're much more geographically spread out is also requiring a lot more transmission, a lot more lines to get to them and a lot of different kinds of lines to make sure that we can, can do that. So, you know, it, it's not just that the kind of, um, that the kind of resources we're using to create our energy are changing. The landscape of what that looks like is changing as well. And, and both of those matter when we are thinking about the ways that we'll ensure these assets in the future. So Commissioner Kreidler, we've heard from the Sierra Club and Commissioner Arnold. Uh, what do you see as the role of green energy resources uh, currently and uh, in the foreseeable future? And uh, you know, this is a, a transition panel. So if there are transition issues you wanna mention, please uh, feel free. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you for moderating this. And uh, thank you to the, the C4I. Uh, conference uh, uh, in Connecticut here, and we do a similar event out in the state of Washington, just to let people be aware of that. And and it's one where we've been doing it on an annual basis, our climate summit, and and it's clearly one where uh, we'd like to uh, encourage all departments to essentially follow that same lead. Uh, I'd like to address uh, climate change. Uh, uh, we, we need a, a transition to as quickly as possible. I think uh, Samantha outlined that very well. In, in a world where there is no carbon emissions, or at least we brought it back to historic pre-industrial uh, levels, uh, we will be. We will also probably need to or to, to uh, remove. Uh, some of the carbon that we've already put into the atmosphere, starting with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this is a massive effort, but it will be uh, done largely uh, for, with existing technology that is already known uh, to the insurer market. Um, for example, in Washington state, uh, almost 85% of electricity comes from uh, renewable energy, 62% hydro, 13% wind and solar, and 9% nuclear. Uh, on a windy day, <laughs> there are states like Iowa where 50% uh, of the electricity is generated with uh, wind. Um, there's already insurance uh, for all for all of these. Uh, this is uh, this. And it's a uh, all private market except for nuclear, where you do have the invention of the Price Anderson Act of 1957, which provides coverage for nuclear. Uh, Washington is the fourth highest uh, number of registered electronic vehicles, electric vehicles. Uh, we we don't uh, hear companies uh, from. Uh, from from these uh, with these vehicles uh, complaining about their insurance, I can assure you. 
Um, granted, uh, as an as a nation, we have a long ways to go. Uh, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration in 1922, only 13% of the, the, the nation's primary energy consumed came from renewable, 36% from petroleum, 33% from natural gas, 10% from coal, and 8% from nuclear. Um, the discussion today uh, may touch on uh, the practices of uh, taking carbon uh, from the air atmosphere and storing it in the ground. Here again, this practice is a mature technology that has been around uh, since the 1970s. Uh, Marsh, uh, Cl uh, Chubb, Liberty Mutual, Allianz, and I'm sure there's others uh, that have stepped forward and uh, would be prepared to offer and advertise currently uh, carbon capture uh, storage. Uh, green hydro may be one day also a uh, big part of the solution to, to the costs of uh, drawing down uh, carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, green hydro is, is produced through the electrolysis process of uh, water and, uh, and um, electricity. And, and uh, but in the, if the electricity comes from, comes from uh, a green source, um, you separate out and you have hydrogen and, uh, and you have oxygen as the only byproducts. In fact, in Washington, recently, we were chosen by the federal government for a major um, infusion of capital to create a green hydro industrial hub here in the United States, here in the state of Washington. Here again, the technology is mature and insurers should be well positioned uh, to ensure this process uh, uh, at scale. Uh, so it's not one of, of having to reinvent uh, insurance coverage. It's there, it's available, it's just us stepping up to it. Technology uh, to achieve a carbon neutral world and the insurance industry knows how to, to insure it. The problem is, uh, 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 is that we we will come up. We've come a long way, but we've got a long way yet to go. It's important to, that we avoid the enemy that we all face, which is inertia. Well, let's get going. Let's solve this problem. Well, thank you, uh, Commissioner Gottfried. <clears throat> you have. Uh... Uh, a different perspective coming from uh, North Dakota. Um, can we have your comments about you know the current grid and the grid infrastructure and 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 your views about the transition? Yeah, sure. So thanks, Dennis, and thanks to the the C four I for the invitation. Um, I I am probably a, a may have a different viewpoint than some of the other panelists on here, and I think that's okay. That's that's a good good for discussion and and probably makes good for viewership. Um, you know, I'm I'm John Godfrey, I'm North Dakota Insurance Commissioner. I come from an energy producing state, um, and so we we've we've got a very unique uh, mix of lignite, oil and gas reserves. We have wind, we have we have uh, uh, hydro, we have we have a good strong mix of energy production. Um, and and some of the discussions that we've had around our state is again, uh, we've been issued or we our governor issued a carbon neutrality by 2030 goal to, to set forward, which is a little bit of a surprise, I think, coming from a state like North Dakota, who is a, a very much an energy exporter and has been traditionally in that uh, lignite coal and as well as oil and gas. And and I, and I think so. The the broad discussion of what all this is and where does the insurance sector fit into it, I think, is is one that's gaining more steam. And I, I think my viewpoint on it is more along the lines of, I, I'm not sure myself as a, an insurance regulator should be an energy regulator or a climate regulator. Uh, we certainly are facing the impacts of climate change and, and are dealing with that even here in our state of North Dakota. Um, but it's it's looking at the affordability and availability across all sectors and what that means and where this touches, Dennis, and your question on the, the transmission and the grid reliability. You know, a lot, I, I think there's a comment made that this technology is readily available and easily you're ready to deploy. And I, I'll take a little bit of um, uh, a little bit of an object, objection to that. I don't think we're quite as readily available to deploy that energy to our complex grid transmission grid as we as we'd like to think, 
Um, you know, we've got battery storage technology issues. We've got, you know, how do we handle extreme temperatures? Both we get the both hot and cold here in North Dakota. And so it's managing that transition to whatever the next energy source is, I think is critically important. Um, you know, we're going to need more energy in this country, in this world going forward. And we've got to figure out a way to, to handle that. And that includes how do we manage that base load requirement that we need? I mean, uh, Commissioner Kreidler mentioned that there's a, a, a massive uptick in demand in electronic vehicles in in Washington. Uh, similar here in North Dakota, uh, the biggest supporters of, of uh, electronic vehicles in North Dakota is our is our lignite energy coal industry, uh, because they know that that has to power those vehicles. And so, as the demand continues to increase, um, looking at uh, removing that availability is going to become a challenge. And it's not so much the the, the larger industries where we're seeing in North Dakota where the where the impacts are coming are on even on the transmission line in, insurance, even on those smaller service industry pieces. And so it's it's how do we manage this transition to whatever what's next is really, really important because I think there's going to be a host of societal impacts if we don't do it correctly that we may not be aware of in terms of if I can't, if I don't have the energy to heat my home, if I'm if I'm facing rolling blackouts, I think this country will <laughs> will revolt in some, in some respects. And so how do you manage that transition uh, with the technology that's available and, and currently deployable? And, and then again, where does the insurance industry lay in that? I think, uh, again, we're financial regulators. Um, we look at risk, we, we monitor those type of things, um, but putting us in the position of being either, you know, climate regulators or, or energy regulators, I think is, a, is potentially a mistake. And I think we're getting more and more push in that space and it's something that I, that concerns me as, as again as an insurance regulator is how do we manage that as I'm not an expert in energy, you know Commissioner Arnold has that in her portfolio she's able to probably has a little bit better viewpoint than I do on on some of those pieces but the majority of the states that insurance regulators aren't energy experts we're not climate experts uh, we certainly understand the impacts and and need to manage those and figure out how best to do this but this needs to come from a broader nationwide or global plan on how do we handle this energy going forward and then the insurance sector can layer in that that's that's my opinion well thank you for that and and you did mention the uh the state's uh plan to uh achieve carbon neutrality um is that plan readily available published on the governor's website or something like that so the the goal is certainly published out there um we are uh we are working hard towards carbon capture and and carbon capture storage we've got a unique geology in north dakota where we're able to um we, we put 252 billion tons of carbon uh back into the ground uh through carbon storage which would be enough for four thousand years worth of our our total output um and then so we'll be a, a carbon importer probably which is a i think is, is going to be important going forward but we're as as much as that is available, we're still facing impacts from, you know, this is a new technology. Uh, is this covered? Is this should this be insured? And and you also got siting issues. I mean, we're we're going through uh, all this would be run through pipelines. All this would be run through those issues. Those create environmental impacts. And so, it's it's hard to know where the goalposts are at times uh, with this transition. And I think that's one of my my big concerns is it feels the goalposts continue to move and and whatever we're switching to the technology may not be there to pick up that entire base load. And so if we make that switch as a society or as a country, as a, as a global uh, unit, what does that mean for the people that, that rely on this electricity? And so I think we've got a lot of uh, interesting projects in the, in the way, but I think it's this transition that's going to be critically important over the next probably, you know, seven to seven to 10 years, what this looks like and how do we manage that transition as a, as an entire society. Well, that's a perfect segue to our representative of the private insurance uh, market, uh, John Huff. Uh, John, how do you um, view the role of insurers historically and currently? Uh, we'll talk about uh, some of the future issues uh, in another question, but please give us your thoughts about uh, some of the comments you've, you've heard and uh, how, how insurers can help. Well, thanks, Dennis, for the question, and, and th let me thank uh, Commissioner Mays and the Connecticut Department for the opportunity to be here uh, with my esteemed colleagues today. So I am a recovering regulator. I was uh, Missouri Director of Insurance for eight years, and I was president of the NAIC in 2016. It's been a while ago. Uh, and then I joined the Association of Bermuda Insurers and Reinsurers. We're celebrating our 30th year this year. 
uh, mainly representing the large, um, what we call class four reinsurers in Bermuda uh, that started 30 years ago providing a NAT cat coverage. And we didn't know at the time that was really climate risk finance. And so really doing quite a bit of, of weather related protection around the world now in 150 countries. So uh, I guess the, the headline question is the what's the role of insurance and historically that role has been to support global economies uh, in ways that help identify risk and, and more importantly, how do we share uh, the risk uh, once they're identified and then transfer some of that risk. Um, the issues raised today certainly uh, involve supporting the transition uh, of the economy as we transition energy sources. But I also would just like to uh, raise a, a, a caution of being humble in our role of what is the role of the ins uh, insurance industry and insurance supervisors in this transition that really we, um, and some of these points have been made by some of the previous speakers, um, is the role of the insurance sector and the insurance supervisor to make some of these energy decisions, or is it then to support those decision makers, those policy makers that are making those decisions, and then supporting the, the risk transfer mechanisms um, that are built around uh, either existing energy sources or the transition to energy sources. And I think that's important to uh, remember. Also, there's been some points about affordability and accessibility. Uh, of coverage, which is uh, a, a growing concern. Um, I've just come off a, a full series of, of conferences as we look toward our what we call our January 1 renewals in the reinsurance space. And you're seeing more and more concerns about the availability of, of, of capital in this space. And the, the analysts think right now there'll be uh, there will not be a large influx of capital in the reinsurance space in 2024, at least for uh, new startups, There, but there may be some available uh, capital infusions for existing operations. So we really need to keep that in mind. It is a, a finite source of capital in supporting insurance and reinsurance, and how does that translate into contributing to the global economy and in the energy selection? So look forward to the, the dialogue of what's going forward as well. Great. So I appreciate that. So what? So we ha we currently have, and this is a question for for all of you. Um, respond extremely pithy, so we can get to some other questions. Um, we we've mentioned some of the energy transitions uh, and the need for it. Um, what's on the horizon? What new technology exists, or is is likely to come on on board and uh, What's the role of insurers and reinsurers in that? So we'll we'll start with uh, Samantha. We told you we'd get back to you. <laughs> sure. Well, I think it's really important to um, first recognize the technology that's already out there and really make sure that that is being supported um, with investments and with underwriting to to take off. Um, even greater than it has now, you know, wind, solar, battery storage. These are the main um, things right now um, that can be deployed um, and that need the support in order to, to become a reality across the board. Um, new technologies, new things, you know, could be decades into the future and the time is short. You know, it's 2023, we have till 2030 really to minimize the risk from climate change and reduce emissions vastly. So I just, you know, I know we always wanna look and see what the next thing is. And I'm sure the other panelists have thoughts on new technologies that might be coming, um, but the ones that are here, we really need to make sure that we're um, leaning into fully. Uh, Commissioner Kreidler, do you have uh, some thoughts about the future uh, that you'd like to share? Well, <clears throat> one is I, I, I don't believe that we're, we're going to get anywhere if we get into the position of actually telling insurance companies what kind of uh, risk they should be insuring, and uh, this is this is one where I think the insurance companies, uh, uh, as long as they are unencumbered uh, by 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 um, by government, uh, will will proceed to analyze the risk and uh, make the decision as to whether this is an insurable uh, event taking place. And I can tell you right now, 
that it's very mature out there right now from the standpoint of much of the technology, as I was saying earlier, uh, that that's available to the, to, uh, 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 to to uh, any enterprise, and therefore, I don't see it as being an impediment uh, by by any means. And I really see it being one of where in, there's great opportunity for insurance companies from the standpoint of the type of investment that they're making uh, in in the uh, that, uh, that, that this is a way that they can actually do much better financially, and that should that is clearly a major driver for them. Uh, the worst part of it would be. Uh, to tell them that the, the technology may be changing a little bit. I mean, I, I, but uh, uh, but even stuff like uh, 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 green hydrogen is something that has been around for 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 a long period of time, and there is uh, uh, the admitted market is prepared to step up and ensure that market. Um, if but again, it's it's a matter of. Uh, having the will and on the part of society to put those projects out there. I don't think that insurance is going to be a stumbling block unless government puts impediments in the way of insurance going forward. And I think that would be a huge mistake because I think the change is something the American public, uh, we're seeing that with uh, electric, electric vehicles. Uh, it's just one, one example how quickly that has matured into a society. I think the society's ready for it. It's a matter of making sure that uh, we as a society are prepared to move forward aggressively. Well, thank you. So, uh, Commissioner Arnold, uh, I'm shifting a little uh, in the in the topic. Uh, we seem to have agreement that uh, we need to reduce greenhouse uh, gases um, and that you know mitigation of energy sources uh, in a productive manner. Uh, what's the role of uh, adaptation to the the changing climate? Uh, that's part of the transition. It's not necessarily the energy transition itself, but uh, I'd appreciate your thoughts on that. Sure. So the energy transition is going to look like a few things. So I mentioned earlier that it will look uh, geographically different. So whereas uh, a, an agent writing a farm, you know, in rural Minnesota may have thought about agricultural things like structures, animals, crops, now often those will have some combination of wind and solar on them as well as, as my grandma has signed a contract for solar, she calls it an extra crop. Um, and so for those who have chosen to, you know, put those kinds of resources on their land, the agent that's used to dealing with them in the insurance space will have to, you know, figure that out. Similarly, you know, three of my neighbors have put up solar over the summer. We're thinking about the same on our house. So um, individuals are more often contributing to our overall generation than, um, you know, than they have in the past. And so that I think is one of the big differences. And as we think about ensuring those kinds of, you know, fundamentally energy generation assets will have to, you know, different kinds of people will need to be involved in those conversations. The other thing is that there are a lot of new technologies. I mentioned hydrogen is one of them. Minnesota uh, and North Dakota were uh, uh, part of a consortium of states that were just awarded you know, over a billion dollars to, or just under a billion dollars, excuse me, um, for a hydrogen hub. So hydrogen is a, you know, is a really promising um, potential technology, not just to uh, generate, um, you know, to, to generate clean energy, it's also to decarbonize other car sectors like agriculture and um, steel is another one that, that hydrogen's um, kind of, you know, ha folks have their eyes on um, hydrogen as a way to decarbonize those um, those sectors as well. That's a new technology. As we learn, we'll learn, you know, as we learn more about it and see how it gets into use, we'll learn about the insurance aspects of it as well. Carbon capture is another one. There's a pipeline that's planned um, from Iowa up through North Dakota and South Dakota that has gotten a lot of attention in part because of Trans, uh, transmitting that carbon in a pipeline is, you know, a, a technologically hard thing to do. <laughs> and we'll have to figure out how, you know, as 
technologies like that come on board um, and maybe some technologies that we haven't thought of. How will those, you know, what are the risks? How do we think about them in this future state? And, you know, how are we kind of making sure that we're paying attention to what is happening in the future, which will look like what I've described and possibly some other things. Um, and then how do we have the resources to make sure that there is, you know, risk mitiga mitigation for the, you know, for the structures of those through insurance. So in terms of the, uh, the current fossil fuel production, uh, do you anticipate that being part of the mix uh, as, as we go forward uh, and for yeah. what period of time do you have? A, yeah, you know, I, th that? I think I think that's up in the air. You know, the economics have changed quite substantially over the last 10 years. So wind and solar are now cheaper than coal. So you're seeing coal plants, um, you know, be retired, uh, not just because states like Minnesota have have carbon reduction goals, but also because of the economics. So the economics will drive, you know, some of the fossil infrastructure to uh, to be retired. Many states have carbon reduction goals that will also, you know, drive those to be retired. Whether there's, you know, nothing that is fossil based or not, I think that's a little too early to tell, particularly because some of the renewable um, generation is intermittent and there there is a base load that needs to be carried and that could be carried by nuclear that could be carried by you know um, battery storage it, it may be covered by some fossil generation as well heating you know heating is is hard <laughs> heating can be done with electricity we we do it in uh in minnesota but you can um but that you know th those are the kinds of things the other is transportation you know it it, it'll be a while, if ever, for there to be, you know, zero fossil-based uh, machines that move around or move people around. And so, you know, as we're thinking about the transportation sector, there's likely to be fossil generation, I think, for for much on a much longer time frame. Um, and and you know, we're thinking about how that works in our state's carbon reduction goals and our net zero goals. But you know, each state will take that that a little bit differently. John, you know, you've heard uh, Commissioner Arnold's thoughts about uh, adaptation. Uh, what what are your views about adaptation and how it works in the, you know, can help with insurance and, and risk transfer? Yeah, well, I, I think you're seeing some of that already. I think you're seeing some, some investments and some movement in technology, at least I can speak for my state. Certainly we've put uh, even in our last legislative session, we put $1.2 billion into this adaptation, I'd, I'd argue, kind of transitional movement. Primarily, a lot of that is going into the carbon uh, capture and sequestration. So that's 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 the technology I think that we've kind of uh, looked to attack that one not only benefits North Dakota, but it also, I think, benefits the overall goal of moving to a, a, a low carbon or no carbon future. And and I think that's that's where you're going to see some uh, some large opportunity, right, to with it's our belief with this you can maintain some of that base load energy requirement which is critically necessary for this at this point until we get to whatever battery storage or whatever whatever the next new technology is whatever comes next uh, but still be able to maintain a, a, a fully functional society to be honest um I, I would caution i think there's one thing in this in this adaptation or transition that i i'm not sure is getting enough attention necessarily is and and this may not be agreed upon by many of the panelists here but um, you know, this, this energy formation and energy industry is, is, is relatively mature in a lot of spaces. And I think we've, there's seen some significant movements and the latest is again, the carbon capture and where that, how do we get to that low carbon emission or low, no carbon emission from some of our traditional energy sources, uh, the same scrutiny needs to be given for these, these next, uh, the next sources. So, um, you know, what are the results of, of, of the green energy boom? What, what are some of the, are there battery issues how do we dispose of batteries that have gone that are out of commission how do we dispose of some of the other products and pieces that are a natural result of of these production and so making sure we're not trading one environmental issue for another i think is really important and that's why i think our our, our strong support for that carbon capture piece not to say that there aren't going to be issues with that and there, there are issues with everything you do but i think that attaching new technology to an existing industry uh, I, I think will allow for that transition to be as as quick as some would believe we need to have it. And so 
Um, you know, like I said, North Dakota has invested a significant amount of dollars into getting to that next wave of energy or next energy production source. And, and that's going to, that's going to, I think is what can hopefully get us to that adaptation to whatever the new normal is. Thank you, John. Uh, Huff. Yeah, we had uh, Commissioner Gottfried once again provided the perfect transition. He discussed risk issues, and and you represent insurers and how how they look at the risk of new technologies, uh, uh, changes in the climate. Uh, you know, provide your thoughts about the role of uh, insurance in this changing world, as well as uh, the role of adaptation. So I'll take a step back because I think it is important to realize that the, the U.S. system of state-based insurance regulation does have the tools necessary for providing coverage with new technologies. So I think uh, Commissioner Kreidler referenced the, the uh, advances that the admitted market's making, uh, but also a significant growth right now in the excess and surplus lines markets. So um, uh, uh, where perhaps there's more creativity and more innovation and in, in new product development and, and ability to put capital behind some of these this new technology. Uh, uh, risks that are uh, perhaps harder to explain uh, in an admitted mat uh, for admitted market format. So uh, the tools are available, and and um, I think that the the coverage will be there. You you see much more sophistication at the underwriting level and, and the um, investment in in weather and technology of where those products can go. Um, you know, I think sometimes when we talk about adaptation, it's good to pause because we, we don't know our audience for this seminar. They'll likely be more educated on all these issues, but really just explaining what adaptation is. There's, there still seems to be a great deal of confusion between adaptation and mitigation, but really adaptation is just taking actions to reduce the negative impacts of, of climate change and build resi resistance uh, to climate-related shocks and stresses across all of our systems. And so this may be changes in our processes or practices, as well as physical changes to the environment to better manage uh, climate impacts. Um, you know, it may be as basic as uh, going back and revisiting building codes, which we see a renewed interest in about just making our, our homes and businesses more resilient. Um, so there's some foundational steps that certainly can be taken and supported by insurance supervisors um, and the industry. Thanks, Sean. So um, what is the role of insurance regulators in this process? We've already touched on that. Are, are there things that regulators can um, be doing, leaning in? Uh, John Huff, since you're the former commissioner, you get to be the gadfly number one. Uh, let's have your thoughts. Well, first and foremost, the insurance supervisor or regulators or role is to uh, ensure the, the solvency of the of the entity uh, providing coverage. Um, and so that means uh, making sure there are guardrails in place uh, on the liability side, on underwriting of risk, but also guardrails on the asset side. Uh, I'll probably go into less on the asset side. Oh, uh, uh, we represent uh, mainly large property and casualty reinsurers where much of their asset mix is, is very traditional, even treasuries. We have to uh, constantly be ready for that Cat 5 hurricane. So very conservative liquid investments, which might change on longer tail investments. Uh, but on their underwriting side, it's really allowing the, uh, the freedom to get out uh, for underwriters to write business and to do so in an environment that we we use our number one tool that's practical for supervisors, but also the industry, and that involves um, uh, making sure that we have rate adequacy. It's so important for an insurance supervisor to know that it, um, an entity is writing coverage at a rate that is adequate to cover the losses. And there's so many tools available to supervisors, whether it be loss ratios or the financial reporting, to ensure that's the case. And we're seeing a great deal of emphasis of rate adequacy now because it's really the best barometer, if you will, of how much a risk should cost. And you see it vary by market. Uh, you also see it vary by entity because of the, the use of non-correlated risk. 
And that's where we're really seeing uh, um, an added benefit for large reinsurers because they have the benefit of non-correlated risk. If they're taking California wildfire along with Missouri tornadoes and Florida hurricane risk, but also adding Japanese typhoon, a typhoon risk, um, then you have that benefit of the non-correlated risk um, uh, really uh, playing to their benefit and all, ultimately uh, an, an advantage for consumers and supervisors. So this has been a tremendous uh, discussion and time is flying fast. I wish we had more time. So I'm going to give you all an opportunity to uh, provide your your closing thoughts, incorporating uh, the roles of insurers and regulators uh, what do you want policymakers beyond the insurance industry to do? What do you want regulators to do? And, and what should insurers be doing at this time? We're going to do it in alphabetical order. We'll start with Commissioner Arnold. Sure, of course. <laughs> uh, you know, I think that, you know, as we're thinking about insurance, it's, it's kind of, um, you know, insurance is a tool that entities have to manage their financial risk. And, you know, it should continue to be a tool to, to manage financial risk, you know, over time. And so, you know, whether that's protecting assets, I think we need to have really good, honest conversations about, you know, what does need to be insured, what needs to be insured for the good of, you know, the, an economy or, um, you know, companies and also for workers, there are, you know, folks that are working across all of these sectors and, you know, having, you know, uninsured assets isn't isn't a great um, spot to be in. That said, there are, you know, sort of economic drivers that are moving insurers and others away from um, uh, away from fossil assets in particular. And, you know, I'm, I'm not one to think that we should be necessarily wholly shifting the market if the market's going somewhere that, you know, we should be mindful of that and understand that that's where it's going, but make sure we have appropriate, you know, financial solvency rules in place, make sure we understand what the risks are as the com as companies are taking them on or are shifting their asset profiles. Um, if the market is moving in a particular direction, then we should know if there are gaps as a result of that movement. Um, and then, you know, adapt our regulatory space to understand, you know, where that movement is. Um, I think it's important to also just know what's happening and where companies are going. <laughs> and um, because that that helps us understand what our market looks like now, what it'll look like in the future, and how that'll impact, you know, folks within our state uh, and, and beyond. Um, and so I think, you know, it's important for this to be top of mind. I'm glad that the uh, Connecticut, Connecticut Department is pulling together this conference. I think it's really, you know, it's a big systemic change. It's it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be probably uh, super clean. It'll, you know, sometimes change is messy and that's okay. That's how things, you know, that's how innovation happens. That's how many of the things that we now know in our everyday life have happened. And, but as regulators, it's incumbent on us to understand that, understand kind of what direction the market is going and then making sure that we can kind of shape it in a way that, you know, works for our state. So let me just follow up on a comment that you made. You were talking about letting the market adapt. Um, that's, contrary to what some have said is that there should be more of a directed focus to uh, encourage insurer investment in underwriting to to move towards green and away from fossil fuels. Do you have a view on that? You know, I think that um, the, so I'll take the example of, of Minnesota. Um, we have in our state legislature out of this last session, um, a hundred percent uh, clean energy or carbon-free electricity by 2040. So that's a, something we've set for the energy sector. The insurance sector is going to follow that and, you know, follow it to the place where other sectors are going for, um, you know, states to meet decarbonization goals. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess I'm not to sidestep the question, but it's happening. And so, you know, there, and it's happening kind of at a pace that is, you know, 
fairly rapid, which can be a challenge and we should make sure that there are insured assets. Um, but I, I'm not sure that it makes sense in either place to be pushing to, um, we should, we should be making sure there's insurance and as the market is going now, mostly that's going to be transition to, uh, renewables and away from fossils. Do you have any other thoughts that policymakers should consider uh, going forward? Yeah, um, and I think there's another panel on this, so I won't take that thunder too much. But I do think that, you know, as we've had conversations, um, resilience and community resilience and an ability to have a conversation beyond just, I insure this property and it has these features and I think it might flood this many times, but to really think about how as communities and individuals and um, you know, our, our, our places that we live are more resilient. So there's a lot of federal money that um, is available to help with resilience. I'd love to see the insurance sector kind of there and having conversations because if a community is putting in uh, you know, a flood barrier, or they're like thinking differently about the way that they manage their water as an example, then that's a, you know, a fundamentally different landscape for selling insurance, for underwriting insurance, and for the people in that area, if it's been flood prone for a long time. Um, you know, similarly with ways to have, you know, when you enhance the electrical grid and can get you know, make it more weather resilient than instead of having a week of power outage or four days of power outage, you're down for 24 hours. That matters for insurance because you have a whole lot less damages when people are able to, you know, get their lives back up and running. So I'd really love to see a more broad conversation and more um, intentional action to to say this is something that we can all work on together. It's something that we can invest in our communities. There's a lot of federal money. There are a lot of municipalities and states that are thinking about how to be more resilient and how do we make sure that we engage a sector that, you know, if we do it right, we'll get huge benefit from the investments by lower claims cost. Think about the one house standing in Maui and after the fire wildfires or the community in Florida that survived the latest hurricane because they had basically decided that they were going to be a resilient community. The more we can encourage things like that, the more we can help people to be back on their feet after natural disasters, but the more that we can also help to, to make sure that there's a resilient insurance industry in addition to a resilient community. Well, thank you. Uh I can speak on behalf of my association, as well as many members uh, of the insurance industry, that we would welcome uh, the discussion uh, on resilience and, and how insurance uh, plays in that, that area. Great. I'm happy to hear it. Commissioner Gottfried, you're up next. Yeah, well, thanks. It's a that's a very loaded question, um, and and I, I I frankly agree with a lot of what Mr. Huff said, uh, uh, John said earlier. I, I can tell you what, what I don't think we should be doing is getting in the middle of this. I mean, I don't necessarily want to be in the middle of this fight and and getting into the point where we're having arguments over what should and should not be written at our out of my legislative session. Um, you know, when you get prescriptive like that, what what's what my legislature may say in North Dakota may be very different what than what Commissioner Kreidler's legislature may say in in Washington. And when you start pulling the market apart, and it seems like that, you're you're creating problems. And so, um, I, I think our role is is honestly rather boring. Um, I love my job. I love what I get to do, and it's it's fa it's fascinating. But it's it's that financial regulator piece. It's to make sure that the companies are operating in a solvent manner, that they're doing so and with upholding our laws, and that there uh, there there's consumer protection in there. And so. It's not as 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 sexy as I think it's may, maybe made out to be at times, and, and where our role we should be hanging to what we should be doing, um, but and, and so I think it's also that and and trying to encourage you know the availability and affordability and doing the scrutiny that we can there. But the minute we start getting overly prescriptive on good risk, bad risk, and we're making those determinations from whatever capital building we happen to be in, uh, I, I think we're, that's that's rather short sighted, and it's and it's and it's going to create more issues going down the down the road than we probably want to acknowledge. 
And so I think honestly, our role at this point is is as insurance regulators is to be able to have these honest discussions and be like, okay, what is what are the true risks? I'll give an example in North Dakota. We had a we had a lignite energy coal company who who couldn't find insurance. And you know, the the reason that they got from from their primary insurer was well, because we don't write fossil fuels anymore. Okay. But so we go have a further discussion. Well, you come to find out that they're a bad risk. They were a bad risk. I, I wouldn't have written them if you know, as an insurance industry expert. And so it, it's being able to have those honest discussions, to be able to prepare consumers to moderate and mitigate their own risks is really, really important. And that comes from both the industry as well as the regulator side to have those honest discussions with our constituencies. Uh, to, so we're all informed on what's actually happening in the marketplace. And I think we've gotten away from that a little bit. Uh, I, I'm seeing it drive back into that. And there's there's a larger role for the insurance commissioners to be uh, kind of leading some of those discussions and having those honest conversations. But again, when we start straying outside of our lane of that financial regulation, that's when I see problems. And so I guess to answer your question, Dennis, I, I can see more of what we shouldn't be doing than necessarily what we should be doing. And, uh, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Commissioner Kreiler, why don't we jump to you? You you seem to have a foot in both camps. You know, you're leaning forward on uh, a green energy transition as well as, um, you know, recognizing that the insurance industry is different. Uh, please, let me have your, your views. <laughs> well, I, I certainly feel right now in, in the current uh, in, environment that we are economically, and it's probably going to last for a while longer, that it's a very tough market uh, uh, out there from the standpoint of uh, reinsurers in particular uh, that uh, that it uh, it is not these have been not, have not been profitable years and uh, they obviously make adjustments for that uh, unfortunately i wish uh, uh, that some of the insurance companies would point that out that uh, it's the difficulty with reinsurer reinsurance and the coverage and affordability um, and, and availability in some cases um, the, the for certain types of, uh, of projects rather than pointing a finger and saying this is uh, because of meddling here uh, of the, of, it's taking place socially not because of economics because I think the economics are there. I think that that the insurance industry uh, one thing I'd like to see more of, obviously, is some sharing of data uh, when it comes to uh, uh, catastrophic events and, uh, and and the prediction and the, the data that's available so that we can do a better job with that in a much more aggregated basis. Uh, uh, you have government data, which is always going to be public, but uh, industry public information typically is considered proprietary. And is there some way of aggregating that in such a way that we can benefit everybody from the standpoint of the knowledge that's out there so that the right decisions are made? I think that uh, this is a, is a, a real opportunity for the insurance industry right now, uh, as long as they're not Im impeded in, in what they can do and how they invest. Uh, and quite frankly, um, a society needs to be there to make the appropriate adjustments. And one of them is, is certainly when it comes to uh, the challenges of uh, wildfire, for example, which we're getting a lot of right now. And we have in the state of Washington, we're losing four or 500 homes just this fire season. Um, this is one where um, land use and building codes need to be something much more vigorously enforced and standardized so that you get uh, you get the kind of protections out there so so that when you run into a situation it's not a matter of insurers backing away from uh, uh, fire prone areas it's recognizing that we as a society need to do more in order to make it uh, desirable for that investment to take place that's just one example i think we're gonna we're gonna we've got a great opportunity out there for investment for the industry which is going to be profitable for bringing about the kind of dynamic change that the world wants. Uh, and with that, uh, it's going to be something that's going to happen sooner rather than later. We just need to step up to it and not impede it going forward. Thank you, Commissioner. Samantha, you're going to get uh, the almost closing shot here. Um, <clears throat> as as Commissioner Gottfried has uh, posited, the you know, 
we are not in a situation where we can throw a switch and have green energy sources meet all of the nation's uh, energy needs. So with that as the backdrop, what do you want policymakers to do? And since we already have these risks and we need the electricity, how do insurers who are trying to ensure that businesses can operate and produce the the current electricity. What do you want them to do in short and, and longer term? Yeah, so I think it's um, well, first important to recognize that there is a transition happening. We are, there's multiple um, things happening simultaneously, planning, building out the grid and bringing on renewables online. And, uh, you know, as Commissioner Creedler had said, the, the mix in many states is um, has tipped already towards renewables. Um, so, so we are getting there. But what we need insurance, the insurance industry themselves to do is to make commitments that align with um, the goals for a livable planet. And those are, you know, internationally set goals. International insurers have um, have moved uh, and and taken action. And we want to see American insurers follow. And that is not to turn off the tap right now, but to stop, first stop new fossil fuel projects that are going to add to the carbon footprint, then to have a plan for phasing out what exists um, and to do it justly and equitably. And that, you know, we need them to make commitments and, and put action steps behind those commitments. And for regulators, really, I think thinking about, it's a real risk for insurers to keep taking on catastrophic climate losses um, year after year after year. And so we need to make the transition. It's, you know, the risk is financial loss, it's reputational, um, there's a potential of legal risk. Um, and so what they're doing right now is they just can't continue doing it. And so as both insurance companies and regulators, it's really important to um, make commitments and have a plan and action steps to for getting to where we need to be. Well, thank you. And I thank you all. This has been a robust discussion. I enjoyed uh, hearing from you all. The, the issues aren't going away and we need more conversations like this to share our perspectives and, and move in the direction that is beneficial for all of mankind. And with that, I thank you and uh, we thank the audience for, uh, for listening in. Thank you very much.